There are many inventors one could consider ahead of their time, from Leonardo da Vinci drawing up plans for helicopters and Gatling crossbows to Nikola Tesla and all the mad stuff he was doing with electricity. For railways, one such inventor came to light in the late 1800s. But rather unusually, his idea to improve railways wasn't to make them faster or more efficient, but to turn trains into sausages. Born into a well-connected family, Josiah Vincent Meigs was an inventor for most of his life. He'd patented several small devices, designed furniture, and while serving as a Union captain during the US Civil War, he invented his own rifle. Meigs eventually moved to Massachusetts in the 1870s, where he continued inventing, and as urban passenger railways developed, especially elevated railways, he noted how much space the rails took up and how much they shadowed the streets they were built over. Meigs felt that he could do better, and so in 1872 he designed and patented his own railway system. The tracks would be supported on iron pillars and made up of three rails. Long girders would connect the pillars together and on top of these girders would be two load-bearing rails. Between these rails would be a raised third rail. This rail, however, wasn't load-bearing, so could be made out of cheaper materials such as wood. Switching would be done by mounting a section of rail on a hinge joint that could easily swing back and forth. The main wheels of the locomotive and rolling stock were set at a 45 degree angle sticking outwards, and would ride on the load-bearing rails while an additional set of wheels mounted horizontally would grip the third, non-load-bearing rail. On the locomotive, these horizontal wheels would be powered and used to drive the train, while on the carriages they'd be used for braking. Because the rails were so narrow, they would block out less light than a standard elevated rail system, and the way the engine gripped the third rail meant it was also capable of climbing steeper gradients. Meigs spent the next few years lobbying to build an elevated railway using his system, starting the Meigs Elevated Railway Company with longtime friend Benjamin Butler, who'd become a well-known political figure. In 1882, Meigs presented his plans at the State House in Massachusetts, with crowds of people attending to see his design, so much so that spectators ended up invading the reporters' gallery just to get a view. Naturally, people were uncertain of the radical new design, but a Mr. O'Neill, representing Meigs, boldly stated that they were in an age of progress, and that what was good 25 years ago isn't good now. Meigs spent the next three years campaigning to build his railway, fighting multiple bills and facing stern opposition from representatives from Boston. Eventually, permission was granted for a section of track no shorter than one mile, but no longer than three, to be built to allow Meigs to demonstrate his design. He made some adjustments to the design and patented it again in 1885. After raising enough money, Meigs finally managed to build a 227-foot line to demonstrate his railway, opening it to the public in 1886. What he'd built looked nothing like any contemporary railway. Instead, it looked like something out of a 1950s sci-fi. To put that into perspective, this engine was built less than three years prior. The center of mass for the rolling stock was focused on their wheels in order to improve stability, they had rounded bodies to help decrease wind resistance, and were surprisingly spacious for both crew and passengers. The rails themselves were laid out to demonstrate the train's ability to traverse extreme conditions, such as tight bends and steep gradients, while also being much cheaper to build than a standard railway. The locomotive had a peculiar layout, with the boiler and cab being completely enclosed and the tender being completely separate from the engine. The driver would be positioned at the front with an elevated cab to help with visibility, while the fireman was positioned at the back, presumably having to constantly go back and forth between the tender and the engine in order to shovel coal. In most drawings, the driver's cab would have had windows all around to provide a 360 degree view. However, the version that was built only had windows at the front and sides. Meigs' design also prioritized safety, with both the horizontal and diagonal wheels being fitted with brakes and a unique system where the driver could cause all of the couplings to come undone, and for all the individual carriage brakes to come on. The idea being the train would come to a safer stop in an emergency or collision if its momentum was broken up. 
The design wasn't just safe, but comfortable too, with the carriage provided to passengers being spacious, decadently upholstered, well lit, and with enough seating for 72 people. Though it was never made clear whether the carriages were fitted with insulation or heating equipment to keep passengers warm in winter. Meigs' demonstration seemed to work, the design proving capable of not only traversing the difficult line with ease, but with speed and comfort too. Demonstrations continued until February in 1887, when the shed housing both the engine and carriage caught fire. Initial theories were that a stove being used to heat the carriage and engine to prevent them from freezing overnight had started the blaze but Meigs and multiple neighbours suspected the fire was the result of arson, especially as the building containing all of Meigs' original models had also been set on fire. Nobody was ever caught. Despite the carriage being burnt out, the locomotive and tender survived, and so Meigs was able to continue with his demonstrations, putting temporary seats in what remained of the carriage for passengers to sit on. Meigs also wrote a book to promote his design, going into detail how a railway would operate using his system. All the publicity seemed to work, as the Lake Street Elevated Railroad in Chicago showed interest in the design, with some international interest coming from Paris, France as well. Unfortunately, at the last minute, Meigs seemed to have had the rug pulled from under him by electric competition. Not only were electric streetcars and elevated railways proving to be fast and efficient, but their use of a conventional rail layout made them much more appealing to investors. Meigs knew he could easily electrify his design, but swore by steam power, claiming it to be more economical than electric alternatives. By 1894, Meigs was done promoting his railway, and took on the job of building a conventional elevated line between Boston, Cambridge, Roxbury, Charlestown, and South Boston for the Boston Elevated Railway Company. The demonstration line was dismantled while he focused on putting his ideas into practice. Meeks continued to reject electric power and the notion of building subways, insisting that steam power was more economical and the way to go, which turned away many investors. By 1896, Meeks' attempt to build the line how he wanted were fruitless, and he had to give up the endeavor, selling everything and giving up on his railway. Interestingly, it was mostly Boston representatives that had opposed his design in the first place, and now it was the Boston Elevated Railway that dominated the city. What's tragic about Meigs' design is that it genuinely had the potential to be a worthy alternative to conventional railway systems, but Meigs' inability to adapt to electricity left the idea ambitious but unappealing to investors. It's entirely possible that, despite its relative success, Meigs' design would have gone the same way as most other revolutionary railway designs that came before and after it. I suppose we'll never truly know. All we can do is close our eyes and imagine what life would have been like if Boston instead decided to settle not on standard railways, but on the Sausage Express instead. Subscribe for more.